Good evening, everyone. I'm Taja Davis, filling in for Dennis Valera. New information coming in tonight after two police officers were killed. The shooting happened in Palm Springs just a couple of hours ago. What we now know is limited this hour. According to the city's police chief, the two officers were killed when shots fired while they were responding to a disturbance call. A third officer is fighting to stay alive tonight. No shooter has been arrested, and a citywide manhunt for that main suspect is underway. Shortly after the shooting, residents began laying flowers and placing candles outside of the police station in a memorial to the fallen officers. Now, time to check in on your weather. Forecaster Chris Nesman is here. Chris, it seems to be warming up a bit. Just a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't get too excited, but yeah, it was a very nice day today. This was a look about, oh, quarter to five from the Fort Hall area. Super, super nice. Lots of sunshine, lots of clear skies. And with that, of course, a lot of folks were out in the Jackson Town Square, kind of past tourist season. In fact, this is almost, you could say, the lull before the winter season hits. But still, see a couple people enjoying themselves this afternoon. And generally speaking, again, it was a very nice day. Right now in Idaho Falls, 49 degrees plus or minus a few, so it is cool and it is going to get chilly tonight with those clear skies. And you look at temperatures throughout the rest of the region, 40s and 50s. Winds really aren't too bad either. In fact, a lot of calms. Idaho Falls, Rexburg, and Driggs, you don't see that very often. And Viper Radar shows pretty quiet for now, but just over my shoulder, you notice something going on in Washington State. Well, that will kind of be a player for us. I'll have more on that coming up. As for tonight, we're looking at 34 degrees plus or minus a view with light breeze. And again, Taj, I'll tell you more about that storm that's in Washington, how it's going to affect us, as well as when our next big storm is coming in after that one. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. The Organ Donor Awareness Fair took place today in the downtown Idaho Falls Post Office parking lot. Many people showed up to participate in life-size kid events and signed up to become donors. People played, get this, a life-size operation game and gift baskets were given out. The event was to encourage and inform people about the importance of organ donation. After her mom received a kidney transplant, one girl signed up today to become a donor. Here's what she had to say. I plan to be an organ donor. I just want to show that I want to be helpful and I want to be the person that can give people hope in their lives. The event took place from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. today. If you weren't able to make it to the fair, you can still sign up on our website, kidk.com, and search Operation. In health news, the makers of EpiPen agreed to pay a multi-million dollar fine. Mylan will pay $465 million over questions on whether the company had overcharged Medicaid for the drug. The pharmaceutical company was accused of falsely classifying EpiPen as a life-saving allergic reaction treatment. Drug makers pay rebates to Medicaid under the Medicaid Drug Rebate Program. The companies pay less money if the drug is classified as generic. And it was recently discovered that Mylan was paying the lower generic rate to Medicaid for its name brand EpiPen. Under the agreement, Mylan does not admit to any wrongdoing. The company's troubles are far from over. Mylan has been in the headlines for hiking the consumer price of the drug from $100 to $600 over seven years. Trump's campaign is in crisis. There are many Republicans asking Donald Trump to step out of the race just days away from the second presidential debate. He and his team are trying to put out another fire over the leaked video in which the Republican presidential nominee makes sexist remarks about women. Craig Boswell reports. I was wrong and I apologize. Overnight, Donald Trump released this video statement in which he apologized for crude comments he made about women in a leaked video. I moved on her and I failed. I'll admit it. Whoa. I did try and f her. She was married. The 2005 video, obtained by the Washington Post, captures Donald Trump apparently unaware he is being recorded. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the. Do anything. Trump says the release of the 11 year old video is nothing but a distraction. Bill Clinton has actually abused women, and Hillary has bullied, attacked, shamed, and intimidated his victims. Fallout from the video was harsh and came quickly from both sides of the aisle. Any Republican who has said they are for Donald Trump, they need to be asked by the press and others and by constituents right now. 
Do you still think he's qualified to be president of the United States? Some Republicans say no and are withdrawing their support. I'm out. I, I can no longer, in good conscience, uh, endorse this person for president. It is some of the most abhorrent and, of, and offensive comments that you can possibly imagine. At a rally Friday night in Rossford, Ohio, Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, refused to answer questions shouted by reporters about the tape. Craig Boswell, CBS News, Washington. Trump was asked to join Speaker of the House Paul Ryan at a campaign event today in Wisconsin, but Pence intended instead. Coming up, Hurricane Matthew has moved up the coast, and we talked with a local woman living in South Carolina right now and how she's bracing the storm. And we have the opposite here. It was a gorgeous day today, and we do have a storm, not hurricane strength, but we do have a storm headed our direction, sort of. I'll tell you what I mean coming up in your full weather forecast. Stay tuned. And now, your first alert forecast with Chris Nesman. All right, taking a look again, here are the remnants of Hurricane Matthew. You can see bringing a lot of flooding. Again, that is the concern now. The winds are significantly less than they were. Haiti certainly got pounded the worst as far as winds are concerned. Here in the U.S., again, just seeing the rain. But towards Idaho, yeah, nothing. At least right now. Though you look towards Washington State, yeah, there are some showers up there, and that's going to kind of impact us in an indirect manner. In fact, if we take a look at the satellite radar, again, high pressure keeping things nice and clear, but you look further out, well, there is a storm. Now, instead of being kind of a big, deep storm, it's shallow, so it's just going to slide toward north, and really all we're going to see for the next few days is just a chance of showers in the northern areas. So the farther north you go, the better bet you're going to see over the next 24, 48 hours of seeing showers. Even then, you really have to get through Sunday to see it. So there's Sunday for you, not a whole lot. Starting Monday morning, yeah, you see a little something just north of Salmon. So even your morning commute in Salmon, for those that have a commute, probably won't be too bad. By the afternoon, that band slides through the Central Mountains. By 5 p.m., it still hasn't quite made it to the Snake River Plain. It'll definitely be a Continental Divide Central Mountain special. It's not until Tuesday that we start to see it pop up in the Snake River Plain. Even then, folks farther north have the better bet. So, Idle Falls, Rexburg on Tuesday, it's a maybe. Everyone else probably really not going to see a whole lot. And by Tuesday afternoon, it already starts to move out. And by Wednesday, things actually clear out fairly nicely. Now, tonight's lows on the cool side with those clear skies. A lot of 30s, 36, magic number in the northern plain. 
Brexburg and Driggs all include in that category. 37 Blackfoot, 39 in American Falls. How about 42 in Pocatello, 30 Soda Springs, and just at freezing in Afton, Jackson, and Pinedale. Tomorrow's highs, about the same as today. Plus or minus a degree or two. In fact, a little bit warmer in a few spots. The biggest thing that'll be different with these highs, the winds are going to be picking up tomorrow afternoon. They won't be super strong, but we're oh, still talking moderate breezes. So not quite as nice today. Now we are used to winds here in Idaho, but just letting you know it's not going to be as nice. Still pretty decent though. You take a look at the extended forecast. Tomorrow really is the warmest day, and then we kind of bounce around in the mid 60s, which is typical for this time of year. And you see, Pocatello doesn't see a whole lot from that most, the most recent or the storm we will see soon, Monday, Tuesday. They just see partly cloudy skies. It isn't until Friday, Saturday, Sunday that Pocatello starts to see those showers. Idaho Falls, I threw in that 20% chance early Tuesday morning. Again, it's not a big one, but hey, we did stick it there just so you know. Otherwise, again, 60s for next couple days, which again is typical. So tomorrow will be slightly above average. Sam, an extended forecast, 69 tomorrow with a few clouds by the afternoon, breezy conditions, and then Monday, Tuesday, decent chance of some showers and salmon. Wednesday, Thursday, a break, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, more showers as a bigger and more complete storm moves in. Rexburg, 60s, a few 50s Tuesday, Wednesday, even then not too bad. And then we just kind of bounce around with off and on showers for the next couple days, which again, very typical for fall where you have storms that start to slide in on a regular basis. Blackfoot, again, staying partly cloudy skies Monday, Tuesday. Sprinkle, maybe, not going to count on it. And then next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, things looking stormier for everyone. Jackson, 60s and 50s with, again, a storm Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right. Thanks, Chris. Now, back to the presidential election. Senator Mike Crapo is among a number of Republicans rescinding their endorsement of Trump after a videotape surfaced of him making vulgar and sexually charged comments about women. Senator Crapo posted a statement on Twitter saying Trump's pattern of behavior left him no choice but to drop his endorsement. Crapo said Trump's actions and comments toward women have been, quote, disrespectful, profane, and demeaning, end quote. He also tweeted he has spent more than 20 years working on domestic violence prevention, and Trump's excuse of locker room talk is simply unacceptable. So, in the midst of all of this, we have political analyst Dave Adler joining me at the mm -hmm. desk. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here today. Thank so, you. let's talk Trump. With all of this happening, that mm -hmm. video surfacing, is Trump's campaign pretty much done for? I think so. I think his campaign is now beyond recovery. Uh, the reality is, is that his last best hope was to persuade a lot of women uh, who are independent voters to come over to his side, I think he's probably alienated them beyond recovery. Right, okay. okay. And uh, Senator Mike Crapo, among others, have called for Trump to step down, to completely mm -hmm. get out of the presidential election. What is the likelihood of that, and what would that mean for the election? Well, I give Senator Crapo credit for making that call, mm -hmm. and uh, he's joined others who have similarly asked him to step aside. Uh, the reality is, however, is it's probably not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. too late in the game, 30 days to go, to change the name on the ballot. In order to do that, uh, the, the RNC would have to persuade secretaries of state across the country and also persuade courts across the country to make the ballot change. And it wouldn't simply be Republican lawyers in court asking for that change because Democratic lawyers would be in there, oh, no, you don't. And mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that courts would intervene at this late date. So I think okay. Republicans are, are stuck with Trump at the head of the ticket. Right. 30 days is just way too soon to make any big changes like I th that. I think that's right. And so I think the, uh, the focus is going to have to shift to preserving or protecting down-ballot candidates. Okay, mm -hmm. and so then with that, what do you think we can expect between now and November 8th? If, in fact, Secretary Clinton's uh, lead continues to expand, as I'm sure it will, because she's now leading in Republican states, uh, her lead in battleground states is expanding, it means it will give the Democrats the liberty to spend an awful lot of money on down-ballot races trying to retake control of the Senate, uh, engaging in the long shot effort to win control of the House. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the Republicans will have to, uh, I think, pour most of their resources into protecting and preserving those down ballot races, trying to hold on to the House. 
Uh, and so that means that uh, the head of the ticket uh, will play a less, far less important role, particularly as uh, Republican leaders distance themselves from Donald Trump. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dave, and my thank pleasure. you so much for your insight. Thank you. My thank pleasure. you. We'll be back. Eyewitness News continues. Hurricane Matthew is moving north. It's weaker, but it's still very dangerous. It landed on the South Carolina coast as a Category 1 storm, packing winds of 85 miles per hour. And it's being blamed for four deaths in Florida. Holly Furfer is in Daytona Beach with the latest. Hurricane Matthew weakened as it moved up the Georgia and Carolina coasts. But the storm was still strong enough to bring heavy rain, significant storm surges, and flooding with it. Officials warn that residents aren't in the clear just because the storm has been downgraded. But as soon as this hurricane turned inward, which is what we didn't want, yes, it did downgrade into wind, but it upgraded into the volume of water. And water can kill. And what I am going to ask for you is patience. Most injuries, most fatalities occur after a storm because people attempt to move in too soon. Do not plan on going back home today or tomorrow. Early Sunday, Matthew's northern eye wall, the most dangerous part of the storm, hammered coastal South Carolina with hurricane force winds. Rainfall totals are expected to exceed 12 inches in some areas. Matthew killed hundreds of people in the Caribbean, the majority in Haiti. Then it moved on to Florida's east coast. There were casualties and more than a million people left without power. Heavy rain drenched the eastern part of the state, while strong winds pushed debris and trees into the street. Now, as Georgia and the Carolinas wait for the storm to pass, Florida is picking up the pieces. I mean, there's a lot of beach erosion. Quite a few pockets of our road damaged along, uh, right along the coast. And then we still have a lot of flooding, and we still have a lot of downed trees. In Daytona Beach, Florida, I'm Holly Furfer. The storm is predicted to head towards sea after it passes Wilmington, North Carolina tonight. It is possible the storm may wrap back around towards Florida and the Bahamas, but forecasters expect it to remain weak. But damage assessments are well underway. One of those checking out the damage is Nikki Lindsley. Lindsley has family here in eastern Idaho, and she says, along with her husband and daughter, they rode out the wrath of Matthew. No, it's just, it's kind of scary. They evacuated our town. It wasn't mandatory, but they did go ahead and try and get everybody off the coast, that, as many as they could. Did you evacuate? No, 
we did not. So you stuck it out and rode out the storm. What was that like? Um, well, we watched the news the whole time. Our power actually stayed on. A lot of areas did not stay on, but our power stayed on. So we just kind of watched and seen where it was going. It didn't hit us too hard, not as hard as we thought it was going to hit. Lindsley says much of the damage to her property was fallen trees, but not everyone was as lucky. Coming up, a young boy's insane catch is being seen across the country. It was even named number one on ESPN's top 10 plays. Wow, these cameras are more intimidating. <laughs> I don't really feel like being on HD today, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Now, Sports Line with Julia Cox. District play began today for girls' high school soccer. The first round is single elimination, and everyone has that state tournament ticket in mind. So we have the Century Diamondbacks hosting the Idaho Falls Tigers. Gorgeous day for soccer. First half, no score, and Olivia Holt does a great job getting the ball to Daisy Carter. She's unable to finish it, though, but a great look for the D-backs there later on in the 12th minute. It's Century with the corner kick, and Kristen Willis sends it. It kind of ping-pongs off a couple of people, but Oakley Ghost is able to scoop it up. Still no score. 17th minute. Holt gets the ball. She crosses it. Carter tries to finish it. She can't, and then Avery Hull tries to get it past the defender. She can't, and then it kind of just goes back and forth between a few players. Carter tries one more time, but it's no good. And then later on in the 39th minute, Taylor Songster gets the ball. Goss comes out of the net, and then Songster nets it. Century tacks on two more goals to win it 3-0, and they are moving on to the district tournament. Over to football now. The BYU Cougars are 4-8 and 1 all-time against Big 10 opponents. This afternoon they face Michigan State for the first time in program history in East Lansing. And now the Cougars honored Mike Sadler as well as Millen Hicks, two MSU players that passed away earlier this year to the third quarter Spartans lead 7 to 3. Cougs with the ball and Taysom Hill drops back and finds Colby Pearson in the end zone for the touchdown. BYU takes a 10 nothing lead later in the fourth same score. Hill Takes the snap, fakes the handoff, finds the hole, and then he finds the end zone for the 17 to 7 lead. And then less than 10 minutes to go in the fourth, Spartans with the ball. Damian Terry gets picked off by Michael Davis. He gets to the outside, tiptoes a little bit, and then he's knocked out of bounds. That would lead to this. Hill hands it off to Jamal Willis. He bursts up the middle for the touchdown, making it 24 to 7. BYU wins it 31 to 14. Through the air, Taysom Hill completed 18 passes in 27 attempts for 138 yards, throwing one touchdown, no picks. He also rushed for 47 yards with one touchdown on eight carries. 
Williams rushed for a very impressive 163 net yards with two touchdowns. Over to Navy, hosting the sixth-ranked Houston Cougars to the third quarter. The game is tied at 20 apiece. Woolworth for Navy throws a 17-yard strike to Darrell Bonner. For the touchdown, Navy leads 27 to 20. Later in the third, same score. Houston on the offense, and Isaiah Powell gets intercepted by Greg Ward Jr. and he takes it 34 yards to the house for a touchdown. It is 34-20 Navy. Later on, it's 34-27. Navy still with the lead. Midshipman with the ball, and it's worth with a 34-yard pass to Brandon Collins. So it's 41-27 Navy. Fourth quarter. 46 to 40, Navy. Three seconds left, so it's last licks for Houston. They'll throw some laterals, trying to keep the play alive, but the ball eventually gets thrown away, and Navy knocks off number six Houston, 46 to 40. And if you watched College Game Day earlier this morning, Lee Corso celebrated his 28th year on that game day set. He actually picked this upset, so Corso knows. And checking out some other scores, Utah. Is currently losing to Arizona 7 to 3, and Utah State is beating Colorado State 21 to 10, both of those games in the second quarter. That's going to do it for sports. We'll be right back after this. Eyewitness News continues. A Florida teen made a catch that's catching fire online. CNN's, G CNN's Jeannie Moss reports on the bobble of the year. There are more unusual things to catch than a football. For instance, when a crowd walking member of a Dutch band caught and drank a beer. Or when a dad sat his son on the luggage counter at an airport in Poland, the boy fell but was caught by a security officer. There is the baby where he should not be. The baby falls, the father putting on a car. There it is. At least 13 year old Jaden Wilson didn't bobble a baby. The youth football league Pro Titans in Wellington, Florida tried a little razzle dazzle, then passed to Jaden. Watch him bobble behind his back, on his knees, on his feet, bobbles again. Touchdown. An unforgettable catch, right? I don't really remember the play. It was just shocking that I actually caught it when I ended up with it. Jaden's dad was on the sidelines talking to his wife on the phone. He kept bobbling the ball, and I was like, he caught it, he dropped it. He, no, he didn't drop it. How cool is this at the age of 13 to not only be included in SportsCenter's top 10 plays, but to be number one? Look at this play here. Bobbles it six times and makes the play. Catch of the year, tweeted someone, but a naysayer disagreed. If he was actually really good, it wouldn't have been bobbled so much. Try telling that to the undefeated pro Titans, not to mention Jaden's dad. 
He averages about two to three touchdowns a game. But this kid is humble. All that bobbling won't go to his head. Ginny Mo, CNN, New York. Oh. Isn't that amazing? That was really great. <laughs> so you guys cool. are gonna hate Jaden. I know. So I was you just completely keep touching those touchdowns. Completely. Don't don't listen to what the <laughs> naysayers have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us.